Now, whether you were raised in the church and learned the story of the Ark of the Covenant during a convocation in church camp, or maybe during a Sunday school class or in a sermon, you have at least heard the story of the Ark of the Covenant in a classic 1980s film about its raiders. And so, in this first Black History Moment, we shall refer to the biblical text regarding the slaying of Uzzah by the wrath of God, as he recorded, as recorded both in the book of First Chronicles and Second Samuel, books of history in the Judaic Old Testament, which some like to refer to only as fables. So be it. Both accounts begin with King David deciding that he needs to bring the Ark of the Covenant to him. But it is a sacred and most holy of items prepared to specifications commanded by the Lord his God, which also included specific instructions as to how it might be transported from one location to another, down to exactly who had the delegated responsibility to do so. But King David had his own plans without consultation with the Lord decided that he was the anointed one and whatever he said had also therefore to be the Lord's will. A temptation from which Christians pray the Lord's prayer to lead us not into while delivering us from evil. And the majority appeared to agree that they had not even asked about the holy of holy vessels since the reign of the last king Saul. But rather than abiding by some antiquated codes and transmitting the tasking to the Levites as had been commanded by the Lord their God, they called upon the sons of Abinadab. Rather than having the Levites carry the Ark of the Covenant by the poles as commanded by the Lord their God, the majority appeared to agree that such a sacred vessel required a brand new cart driven by oxen. Ahio, the son of Abinadab, guided the oxen from the front, while they had a royal band of harps, cornets, cymbals, psalteries, temples, and other wooden instruments in the parade, while Uzzah, the son of Abinadab, guided the cart from the rear. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 6, as well as 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 9, it is recorded, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, and that took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And in direct, proximate, and reasonably foreseeable consequence of multiple failures to follow specific instructions, from the Lord their God, we are told that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God, while King David grew angry with the Lord for smoting Uzzah, who was doing his will, as the Lord yet had commanded he would. And David continued yet to concern himself not with reconciliation with his Lord, but rather how, with Uzzah dead, he might then bring that sacred Ark of the Covenant to him, in accordance with what he and the majority agreed was God's will. Now most would agree today that if the Surgeon General told you not to do something like smoking cigarettes, you would not dismiss it as an antiquated code and totally ignore it. Like Senator Tim Kaine, who even posts selfies on Facebook about leaving church service and delivers sermons on the Senate floor about what the President should not do, because what struck him were the readings of the scriptures he heard in the Protestant church of his in-laws, even if he does not follow the readings of his own Roman Catholic Church with regard to abortion. Perhaps he has a faith with a drop-down menu of things his Lord permits him to accept or disregard. Optional religion. And not being a captive of conscience like a certain Protestant who even nailed some notes on his church 
door. And not a congressional office, albeit, because there is a difference, we are told, between church and state. And we are not a theocracy like some places where if the church says you have to do something, you don't ask questions. You just grab your tennis shoes and just do it. But in a liberation theology and social justice, we concern ourselves with the praxis and require a solid example in the not too distant past or present that parallels and is analogous to the fabled history of the descendants of Israel, which we can call fables without offense and still say Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas to be kind to our less educated friends. And this brings us to a civil rights martyr for the voting franchise who had a church just south of Danville, Virginia in a town formerly called Leakesville, North Carolina, just across the border. A church that today sits on the National Historic Registry in a town that is now called Eden, just like the biblical place in the book of Genesis. And familiar to the erudite academicians who have read John Milton's Paradise Lost. Pastor Charlie Webb was my paternal grandfather, about whom much history has been lost because some things that happened to him cannot be found in government archives because they were not recorded in the Jim Crow era, while also the passage of time and distance of family members tends to cause persons to not bring them to mind, just as even King David suddenly remembered about the Ark when he decided he required it for some special purpose of his own, not in connection to anything that his God had in his plan, leading to redundant failures and fatal consequences to his servant, Usa. And like King David, Pastor Charlie Webb was doing well for a man who may well have been the son of a slave, or at most grandson because he had two churches in rural North Carolina in the 1920s that were thriving. A wife who had gone to college and who had become a primary school teacher, albeit in a segregated schoolhouse, and a seven-passenger Buick for a family car. Truly blessed in worldly treasures. And as the story goes, one day the Lord also spoke to Pastor Charlie Webb and told him to erect a brand new church in the honor of the Lord God he served. One in Leakesville, where he lived in a parsonage right next door with his family, and one in the church he pastored in the town further south of Thomasville. And even in a segregated town, the Lord sent unto Charlie Webb an architect and a builder to erect his tabernacle unto the Lord his God. But we are told that Pastor Charlie Webb got to thinking about how he might improve upon what the Lord had told him to specifically do. As did David, grabbing Uzzah. And despite his parsonage and his family being in a present-day Eden, Pastor Charlie Webb's favorite church was down in Thomasville. So he took it upon himself, and the church agreed, by majority vote, to adjust the plans of the architect that the Lord had sent to him, and add one foot to each dimension, one foot higher, one foot longer, and one foot wider. And it was a joyous day with much jubilation when both churches were erected and everyone celebrated the great accomplishment. And Charlie Webb felt proud. And on that day, Reverend Charlie Webb was shot in the back of the head and left to die in the street because it had looked to someone that he had committed the high crimes and misdemeanors of looking a lot like he was going to vote the Lord sent his wife into the street to find him, bleeding, and finding not even one good Samaritan. It is said that that school teacher in a segregated schoolhouse learned to drive the family car that very day and took her dying husband to the hospital to save him, but they refused to take him in. 
But Reverend Charlie Webb had a very deeply religious and devoted wife who kept on praying and she decided to grab her three children and her dying husband bleeding from the back of his head into towels drenched with blood and proceeded to drive north stopping at hospitals and towns all along the way until they got to Richmond because no hospital would take him in. And his wife, Mamie Lee Morton Webb, whose uncle also had a college degree and had served as a lieutenant in World War I under General John Blackjack Pershing, asked the Lord to help her mind, her educated mind, develop a plan to save her husband. And he told her to drive all the way to the city of brotherly love in Pennsylvania, where she had a friend. And it was only there, in Philadelphia, that a hospital would admit her husband after a long drive from North Carolina to treat the lethal gunshot wound in his head. So on that day, we are told, the Lord spared the life of Reverend Charlie Webb, and he was very grateful. But he lived for only 12 years a slave thereafter to an invalid condition, and never was even half the man he once had been. From that day forward, though, that the Lord had saved him, it is said that he kept his faith in his Lord and God, often heard to say, my God ain't dead yet, and neither am I. And he voted for Republicans in every election until that day he died in Philadelphia, but did not live to see the promised land of his own son graduate from a college or to see the church that he had built in accordance with the plan of his God placed on the National Historic Registry. This has been a Black History Moment. My name is Major Mike Webb, and I am running for U.S. Congress with liberty, honor, and excellence. By God, we shall make America great again. Honest. This advertisement was authorized by Mike Webb. Bad Boys for Life. <laughs>